the ancestors of Pueblo Indians and descendants of Spanish settlers farmed and hunted in Los Alamos, New Mexico, centuries before the United States Army Corps of Engineers established the atomic bomb research laboratory there in 1943. Indian and Hispanic communities have survived for centuries in northern New Mexico. Many residents of these traditional communities joined people brought to Los Alamos from throughout the world to work for the project which ended World War II and initiated the Atomic Age. Base camp. And ground Zero was about 10 miles over that way, uh, right past that structure in the distance there. And uh, as I recall, you see, it had rained the night before, a very heavy rain. And <clears throat> what they had done in back of the blockhouse, due to all the traffic, is they had sprayed uh, asphalt down. But they hadn't bothered to smooth anything out. And, and they, uh, it was just, and the rain then had just collected in little puddles all over the place. And I vividly recall uh, Oppenheimer and General Groves marching back and forth, dodging these puddles, trying to decide whether they ought to shoot that thing off or not. Minutes, let's say, before each hour at 5.30, everyone was reminded that when each hour arrived, that we were all to lie on the ground with our feet toward the blast site, with our arm covering our eyes and no one was to look until a few seconds after the blast because they expected the flash to be so bright that many people would be blinded at least temporarily. Everyone followed instructions to a T. In these minutes, it was interesting to me to listen to uh, some of the conversations that were going on. And these uh, conversations weren't necessarily with each other. Uh, there, there were, <coughs> pardon me, there were a lot of people praying really seriously because no one really knew whether this chain reaction could be stopped or whether it would be stopped. And, you know, we could be all facing our last minutes on this earth. And I had a loudspeaker, actually, and was listening to the uh, countdown. And so I knew when the explosion was to occur. And I had arranged a, uh, uh, a very dense welding glass type of uh, glasses in front of my eyes. And I was looking directly at the zero. I was one of the few people allowed to do that. Uh, it was perfectly safe through these welding glasses. But anyway, I was looking right at it, just staring at where it was. Of course, it was nighttime. I couldn't see anything. But when the explosion went off, the, uh, that welding glass seemed to just glow white, just intense white like the sun. And so it just blinded me. And so I looked aside to the left. The Oscuro Mountains were at the left, and they were just lit up like daylight then. So I looked at that for a few seconds, and then I looked back at, through my welding glass, and I saw that the terrific explosion had taken place, just unbelievably large explosion. And my camera was just sitting there, but soon the ball of fire was starting to rise and I thought, gee, I better be get busy. So abruptly I, I raised it and photographed the ball of fire as it went up to the stratosphere. And uh, I guess, well, I know I was aware that the, uh, the light flash would get to where I was almost a minute before any blast wave arrived, so I had plenty of time to duck and run if it looked uh, like it was going to be necessary. So I simply sat in a chair with using the back of the chair as a
tripod base for the camera. And I, uh, <clears throat> the first exposure, I just had the thing wide open because I wasn't sure. You know, nobody was sure this gadget was going to work. And if it just kind of fizzled and made the light of a half a dozen candles, I wanted to record it. So I fired that one off at count zero and immediately noticed that it was going to work. So I reached down and just without knowing exactly what I, how I was setting it, closed the uh, aperture down and cranked the, uh, the shutter closed and then fired three in rapid succession. The combination of the flash the blast of air, the fantastic noise, and then the sight of this column uh, climbing and climbing and just roiling and climbing. And now, within minutes, we begin to see the sun reflecting off the dust particles. And the colors were, were fantastic. People's thoughts, or at least what they were expressing, there was an awful lot of people just wander off by themselves and, and, and started thinking about it. But once they got back together, I, they were talking more about, well, it seemed to me they were very concerned about what they had done and maybe was this a good idea. And, uh, I, I don't. I can't speak for them. I don't know what they were really thinking. I, I was wondering that myself. But it was done. There was nothing one could do except sit there in amazement at what had just happened. And then we realized, hey, we're still here. <coughs> Pardon me. We're still breathing. Uh, we have just witnessed a new era. It, it was, oh, I guess all I can say is just shock. It was just shock. And that's when we were sitting there for some, you know, some amount of seconds, and we could feel the blast and the heat wave, you know. Well, you know, this still didn't make a big impression on me because uh, the only thing I'd ever seen in the way of explosives was firecrackers, you know, and, and here this, so we had a great big explosive. But this old man, an older man, his name was, I remember his name, his name was Pop, we used to call him Pop Borden. He come from upstate New York. Now this man had worked with dynamite in his days before he got into service. And I recall three, maybe four days after the detonation, that man still couldn't, he, he still couldn't get over it, the detonation. He couldn't get over it. He'd go around and he said, that's the most terrible thing I've ever seen in my life. 